This morning's reading comes from Acts 19, verses 1 to 12. Paul in Ephesus. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they all spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken back to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. This is the word of the Lord. Before I um, before before I uh, launch in uh, to the sermon, I just want to share something personal, uh, which very briefly, which um, was to say that on on Friday, I um, worked out that I had been a Christian for 40 years. So um, that's quite a milestone. Um, thank you for clapping. Um, just to say, I, the reason I share that is because it's good to remember these things and to look back on our journeys and to you know all my life you have been faithful. Um, but also a real encouragement to keep praying for our kids and our, y- our youth who are away at different festivals and different camps and things like that over the summer because um, I reckon most people become a Christian uh, in the summer holidays. I don't know why. So um, keep, that's probably not true at all, is it? But you know what I mean. Um, anyway, it's just a thought. But keep praying for our kids and our young people as they're away because it's significant. These times are so significant for them. Okay, let's crack on with looking at this passage. So um, Kate and I were lucky to be two weeks ago to be in Mallorca for the week. And um, as always, when uh, you go overseas, I was reminded of uh, the Englishman abroad. And the Englishman abroad is just rather embarrassing. I realise I am one. Uh, And particularly when it comes to the native language of the country they are visiting. And I'm reminded yet again that Europeans are so much better at speaking English than we are at speaking any of their languages. And um, I, there are about four categories of Englishmen abroad that I witnessed in, um, I've witnessed in Mallorca and over the years. Uh, the one is what I call the loud and slow Englishman. Um, I had an uncle who I took to Paris on the Eurostar once, and he went up to the ticket booth in Paris to buy us an underground ticket, and he said... Two tickets, please. Um, there's a sort of English thing where you speak loudly and you speak slowly, then people will, the, the foreigners, Johnny Foreigner, will get it. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the second one, which I witnessed in New York last week, was the not even trying Englishman abroad. Uh, 
who went up, who, who we were queuing for ice cream, and the lad in front of me just said, yeah, I'll have a cone with a couple of scoops of pistachio, please. Um, not even any effort to speak in Spanish or anything, um, which I actually think is a bit rude, but I also think at least it's the most honest. The third one, and this is my position, is um, you f you, you, the trier, which is where you throw a few words in. So you say things like, you say things like, hola, which is Spanish for hello, um, and gracias, which is thank you. And, and that's about it. But you, you kind of throw in a few just to make them realize you're not an arrogant Englishman abroad and you really do want to wish you speak Spanish, but you're really sorry you don't. And the final one is what I call the false confidence, um, which, which I'm also, there was a time in um, France, a number of years where I rolled down the window and uh, beckoned a, a French lady over, and in my best French, really good, very good, asked her where the supermarket was. And, but the problem was that was the limit of my knowledge. <laughs> so I was, she perfectly understood the question. She was, I was really good. And then she just rattled off all these instructions. <laughs> and, um, and I had no idea where the supermarket was. So, merci beaucoup, madame. Au revoir. Off we go. Completely lost. Uh, so, um, the reason, the reason I tell you, the reason I, I just, that's a bit of fun. We're talking about language today. And in the passage we had read, it is all about language. And there are three types of language that we see. The first, which we're not going to really talk about, is, is just preaching and evangelism. And that's what Paul does in the second half of that passage. He teaches and preaches to the people in Ephesus. But the two things I want to focus on this morning are two other examples of language, and these are more supernatural. They are tongues and prophecy. Now, they sound weird, but hopefully I'm going to try and um, break them down a little bit. And uh, so can we have that slide a lot later? Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have, um, we, hopefully break down some of these what, what they were. Now, I was going to talk about um, the passage, but I don't think, I'll, I think I'm going to skip talking about the passage to begin with. And I'm just going to jump to one key verse in it, which is, you see, what happens, Paul finds these disciples who, who weren't actually real disciples. They were, they were open. They were expectant. They were, they were disciples of John the Baptist. They were waiting for the Messiah, and they'd been baptized in the sense of repenting, but they hadn't really heard about Jesus. And so Paul teaches them about Jesus and almost immediately, a bit like the Ethiopian that, were, uh, that, we, that you heard about a few weeks ago, almost immediately that they get baptised properly, baptised in the name of Jesus. And what happens is once they've been baptised, verse 6, we see that Paul places his hands on them. Immediately after they've been baptised, he places his hands on them. And what happens is when he places their hands on them, the Holy Spirit fills them. They're filled with God's Spirit which again sounds supernatural and weird, but it is just, I'm going to hopefully normalise it. So they're baptised and they're filled with God's Spirit and two things happen. Number one, they speak in tongues and number two, they start prophesying. Why? Why are they speaking in tongues and why do they start prophesying? Why does God give them those gifts, the gifts of speaking in tongues and the gift of prophesying. Why does he do that for them? Those gifts are available for all of us this morning. If you are a believer in Jesus, he wants to give you the gift of speaking in tongues and he wants to give you the gift of prophecy. Why? Why does he give us these gifts? Why does he want to give us these gifts? Well, quite simply, what he wants to do is to build us up. These are gifts that are given to build up the church. I think we've got the word build up on there. Please, Josh, thanks. To build up the church. And a lot of this comes from um, 1 Corinthians uh, 14, which you can look at in your own time because there's so much depth and richness there. But essentially, this is about building us up. Now, Jesus said, he promises this, and this is on the screen. He says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell won't be able to overcome it. I will, I think we got that, please, Josh. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Now, this is the joy. This is a joy, particularly for those of us whose responsibility is to minister to the church, that Jesus says, I'm going to do the hard work. Jesus has promised he will build his church. He will strengthen his church. 
And this is one of the most amazing things about following Jesus, is that Jesus promises that we can get involved with his work. Do you know what? He doesn't need us to get involved with his work because he is God. But because he loves us and because he knows it's best for us, he says, get involved. Help me in this work of building up my church. I will build my church, says Jesus. Why don't you get on board and help me build up the church? Uh, I used to work for a vicar called David Bracewell in Guildford, and he always told um, this story, which I won't be able to repeat as well as he expressed it. But he told the story when he was a little boy, and he, um, I think they lived in a house or in a house where there was a grass tennis court. And one day as a little boy, he noticed that the tennis court needed repainting, as he'd seen done before. So when his dad was away, so he got his little um, paint, white paint trolley thing, and he thought, I'm going to make my dad so happy, I'm going to paint the lines. So he got out the paint, and he did the lines, and he, and he painted all the lines of this tennis court. And of course, because he was only a little boy, of course, all the lines were really wonky. But he stood back, and he thought, uh, and he thought, oh, I tried my best, but maybe it's not very good. And his dad came home, and he was expecting his dad to be really cross with him, but I can't remember, David tells the story so much better than, than I am, but, but he says what happened was his dad stood next to him and they looked through the window at these wonky lines and said, and he, his dad said to him, David, thank you so much for painting the lines. Next time they need doing, how about we do it together? And that for me is a beautiful picture of what God does with his church. He says, I'm going to paint the lines um, and I'm going to graciously let you come and paint the lines with me. But I'm going to do it, and you can help. And so when it comes to building the church, God gives us two gifts. He gives us the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy to, so we can help with his building. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians 14, 4. It says this, Anyone who speaks in tongues edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Now that word edifies, like the word edifice, is the same word, the same root word that Jesus uses when he says, I will build my church. So he's basically saying, anyone who speaks in a tongue builds themselves. Anyone who prophesies builds the church. Now I used to think that the first one of these was, was a kind of slight criticism. And I used to take that as a um, self-indulgent thing. And I used to read that and go, anyone who speaks in a tongue is just edifying themselves. Anyone who speaks in tongues just builds up themselves, selfish. And I dismissed it. And then I'd read the next bit, yeah, but prophecy is good because it builds up other people. But that's not the sentiment. I think the English translation of the Greek probably doesn't do justice for, it, for, for us there. What it's saying is, if you want to be stronger, if you want to build yourself up, Here's a fantastic gift that you can use yourself and it will build you up and it's called speaking in tongues. What an amazing gift this is that I give to you. And over the years, I've realized how desperately I need this gift. Who here doesn't want to be a better Christian, a stronger Christian? Who doesn't want to love their family more? Who doesn't want to love their neighbor better? Who doesn't want to be more passionate about their faith and about Jesus? Who doesn't want to stand up more for social justice? Who doesn't want to do things better and be better equipped and be more resilient? Who wants to sin less? Hands up. No, don't do that. <laughs> and if you want those things like I do, if you want to be stronger, what it means to be a Christian, then speaking in tongues is a fantastic gift that God has given us to enable ourselves to be stronger. It is such a gift that God has given us. Let me just explain a little bit what speaking in tongues is, because some of you are probably going, this is just a bit weird. It's a language that the Holy Spirit gives us, and it is not learned by us. We can't learn it in a book or through, through an app, but we just allow God to speak through our mouths, and as the wind passes out through our voice box and out of our mouths, we start speaking in a language which is given to us by the Holy Spirit. And we're speaking to God and we speak mysteries about what God is like and what, who he is. Sometimes, and I've never actually personally seen this or witnessed it, but I know some of you have. Sometimes it actually is a foreign language that's a human language that's been learned, but not by the speaker. 
And that was what happened on the day of Pentecost. They started speaking in tongues and people there recognised their own language. And that does happen today. And it's a great tool for evangelism and growing the church. But more often than not, tongues are used in the church or on our own. Now, when they're used in the church, it's really important that there is an interpretation. And that is another gift, which we haven't got time to talk about at great length. But it's important that there's an interpretation. Paul is always very clear that things that are used in church, in worship, are ordered and and bring honour to Jesus and glorify Jesus and aren't allowed to run wild. So it's really important that there's an interpretation. But the main experience that I've had of speaking in tongues is on my own. And there are times that I will speak in tongues because I don't know what other words to use. There are times I speak in tongues because I'm too tired to pray normally. There are times I speak in tongues just because I really don't know what else to do. And it is a gift to me and it strengthens me. It is a gift because it helps us in our intimacy with Jesus. It is a gift because it gives us another level to our prayer life. And how often are our prayer lives frustratingly dry and hard? It is a gift to us because it helps us when we just don't know what to pray. And I think it can be a real gift in spiritual warfare where you feel that the evil one is having a go at you or a friend or a family member and you want to, or the church and you want to pray on their behalf and you don't know what to pray. Speaking in tongues is a great weapon. It's a tool in our toolbox. So that is um, speaking in tongues. Now, the other thing is prophecy. And prophecy builds up the whole church. And there are two types of, of prophecy. One of, the, one of these is foretelling, where, where we, we hear what God is saying and we speak it out. And it's actually, it's not a prediction or a forecast. It's a statement about what is going to happen in the future. Or what will happen in the future unless there is repentance, unless there is forgiveness, unless, unless something else. But it's a gift that God gives us and and it's God's way of speaking his truth into our situation. But more often than not, it's not foretelling. It's not saying something which will happen. It's just forthtelling. It's just God saying what he wants us to hear. And it can be so encouraging It's so encouraging when someone comes up to me and says, Mark, I've been praying for you and uh, I have this prophetic word for you. It can be so helpful because it strengthens us. It can strengthen our life groups. It can strengthen our friendships, our prayer triplets. It can strengthen the whole group of gathered Christians. Sometimes prophecy comes after we've been meditating on Scripture, on the Bible. Sometimes it can come in visions or dreams. I think I've only once ever had a dream, which I thought was prophetic. It was a dream of a pregnant toad, which gave birth to another toad. Anyway, that's a long story. I'm just trying to break it, make it a little less serious. Sometimes it's an audible voice. I don't think I've ever had an audible voice, but some of you might have done that. Sometimes it's even a meeting with an angel. I've never had that. I'd love that. More often than not, and this is the most common for me, and I think this is what I hear most around, is it's words or pictures. I once had a picture for Andy and Fee about that there were a couple of guinea pigs. I'd only been here a couple of months. I think they were a little bit offended that I said they're like guinea pigs. But hey, it was a prophetic word, so I had to share it. But for me, I get an image or a... Do you remember that? No, good. Thank you. Um, for me, it's an image or a picture or an impression. It's just something that comes to my mind, and I feel that is God's truth into a situation. Guinea pigs. One more thing about prophecy is it has to be tested We are fragile humans. We are failing humans. We make mistakes. And so when God speaks through us through prophecy, we can get it wrong. So it's very important that as individuals and as a church, we learn to test the prophecy. We test it against what God is already doing. Does it match up with what God's doing? We test it against its benefits. It says that prophecy is for comforting, for strengthening and encouraging. So does it follow that test? And most importantly for me, the first one, we need to test it against Scripture because prophecy will never counteract or contradict what we read in the Bible. So it's really important that we test it. I'm going to close there. 
We're going to share um, bread and wine together in a moment. Two things to say before we finish, before I finish. First of all, um, when you've received bread and wine, I think Andy will explain this, but a few of us are going to be up at the cross there. If you would like the gift of tongues or the gift of prophecy, when you've received bread, please come and see us and we'll pray for you. God says, seek and you will find. How much He's a good father who longs to give good gifts to his children. If you've never had those gifts and you'd like them, or you've had them in the past and you've let them die down a bit and they need reigniting, then please come and see us. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lay hands on you if you feel comfortable with that. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give you one of those gifts, or both gifts if you want. Please can I encourage you to do that. Um, the other thing, just to, to finish with this, and uh, I, I realise I've whizzed through, and, but, you know, 20 minutes to talk about this such a massive topic. So please can I encourage you to do some research yourself and, and read about it. Read 1 Corinthians 14. But this is just a simple picture which I read about in a book by David Pitchers this week, which, is, which has really helped me and I think might help you too. Sometimes if you've never spoken in tongues or prophesied before, you just need to start. And I hope this is going to work. But you know with the box of tissues, is when you pull out one tissue... It hasn't happened. <laughs> the next one appears. And then the problem is I did this with this same box. At the, I'm looking for another box now. Never mind. And when you pull out the next one, the next one appears. <laughs> Just keep going. I'm, I'm not, it's not a magic trick. I'm not doing magic trick. And when, and when, I need another box of tissues. There aren't any more boxes of tissues. Either. But you get the idea. The idea is that I think when you... St- oh, brilliant. Thanks, Jules. Fantastic. Brilliant. Oh, bless you. That's so kind. <laughs> I hope this box works. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. When you pull out one, the next one appears. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. And you pull out the next one, and the next one appears. And I think this is, a, I read this this week, it's such a helpful picture for when you want to start speaking in tongues or start prophesying. You won't be able to get the whole box of tissues in one go. We need to be patient. And sometimes it just takes faith to take the first step, to pull the first one out to just open your mouth and ask the Spirit to fill it with his language, to speak that word of prophecy out. And then as we do it, we find that increasingly we get better at it. And God, I think, gives it to us step by step by step. So anyway, I feel, I feel I've really rushed and whizzed, which is probably, but that's okay. We're going to have communion. I'll hand over to Andy. I would love to pray for you this morning to receive the gift if you haven't done that. So when you've received, please come and see us and, um, and we'd love to pray for you to have that gift. Let me just pray so I stuff these tissues back in the box. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that helps us grow and helps us build up. And I thank you for these gifts, this gift of tongues and this gift of prophecy that helps us build ourselves up and helps build the church up. And so I pray you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit and we would get better at exercising these gifts so that we can be edified and the church can be edified for your glory and in your name. Amen.